learn about a local art exhibit that promotes the message of living above negative influences. And Anthony Rizzuto from the Seafield Center joins us to discuss proposed legislation regarding access to treatment. An experience in this, the reason that we're doing what we're doing is because a lot of us are experiencing this on a daily basis where people are finally coming to that point where they're ready to get help and when we try to, and there's help available, mm -hmm. and we can't put the two of those together because insurance companies in a lot of instances are denying access. And we revisit the segment about prescription abuse to addiction. Hello, I'm Art Flesher from Suffolk County Health Department's Division of Community Mental Hygiene. I'm your host for Something of Substance, a monthly video magazine. Welcome back. Each month we show how substance abuse, mental illness, and developmental delays affect you, your kids, and your community. We'll also give you a few examples of how services in Suffolk County help people find the inner resources they need to tackle their problems. I had no idea it was going to be so hard. I didn't know what to expect. You hear the stories, but I never took any of it seriously until I found myself here, and then I realized I was going to have to work hard for my recovery. If you or someone you know has a drug or alcohol problem, you are not alone. Recovery was the hardest job I ever had, and the most important. Smithtown's Youth Bureau, School District, and Library have put together a collaborative effort to participate in the national Above the Influence campaign. Students were asked to create artistic pledges that illustrate activities and themes encouraging all to live above negative influences. Above the Influence is a national campaign um, where it, students and young people pledge to be above the influence from um, high-risk negative behaviors. Above the influence is important to me because I've seen a lot of people go through and struggle with different things um, that above the influence encourages people to really go above and to not do. They pledge to be, um, to be free from illicit drugs and alcohol use. I think that this exhibit is important for students and community members because it heightens the awareness of what art brings to the community as well as what it's portraying, which is staying positive, staying above any kind of negative influence. It's important for the Smithtown Library to become involved in exhibits like this and programs like this as part of the community and to raise awareness of substance abuse and to support the kids and the young people who are uh, trying to raise awareness with their peers. This exhibit came about um, through a meeting I had went to and I brought back the idea to our Youth Advisory Board and the Youth Advisory Board embraced the idea and Alexandra who sits on our board took it even further and came up with an idea to make it um, an artistic pledge for Above the Influence. The national campaign Above the Influence, um, their symbol is a circle with an up upward arrow and the upward arrow basically says to do the better and to be above all the different peer pressures and negative influences. The Smithtown Youth Bureau um, is, is a town department and our mission is to work with young people and their families and just to come up with different activities for them to be able to be engaged in that create positive youth development and positive decisions and just overall um, healthier lifestyles. It was so important for my students to feel empowered that they could express themselves through their art and have their art displayed visually in the community because this gave their sense of expression and their thoughts a visual outcome that then is seen by people who then in turn react to what they have created. So in knowing that their artwork was going to be displayed at the library that is in their hometown of Smithtown gave them great pride. I believe our young people sometimes succumb to peer pressure because maybe it's something that their friends are doing 
or maybe they feel lost or out of place and they want to feel connected with something. And so they go and maybe um, use drugs just to escape and to go into a crowd of people that they want to be a part of. I made the decision to be above the influence because I care about my family and my friends a lot and I don't want them to have to worry about me or for me to have the extra pressure that I need to get out of this bad habit or you know, if I don't have more drugs then you know, whatever. So I really did it just to, for the better of my health and for my family and friends. Prevention is key to keeping our kids educated about um, the dangers of drug use. We want to make sure that we get them um, to make better informed decisions to lead to healthier lifestyles. I think kids do it to act cool, to really relieve some pressure that they think that it'll relieve it. And really they don't think about the future, they just think about the present and what's going to happen now rather than what are the effects and how am I going to cope with this later. Well, the art here created in Above the Influence helps to evoke a social change because it's about feelings being represented in images. Art is obviously visual, and so people come and they see, and then this helps them to think further about deeper issues at hand. And right now, we have students who wrestle with many, many issues in their lives, and so it gives them pause to consider what they are, dealing with and that they want to take charge of their own life and stay above the influence. I think using artwork and posters um, um, and music actually uh, is a great way of promoting um, awareness, uh, especially the visual because I think people are really tuned into that, especially young people right now. Uh, it's a visual world and it's a, it's a quick way to have a lot of impact. I, I think it's a terrific and it's a way for people to be able to express themselves in a way that maybe they aren't as verbal sometimes. Awareness and education are very important because a lot of times our young people fall into traps where maybe they weren't given the proper education about um, decisions like using drugs that to understand how addiction forms and how quickly it can form and how it can lead real fast to um, being injured or even to die from it. I hope that my friends and family and everyone who comes to see this event really gets inspired by it because you see everyone decorated the pledges in different ways, whether it's with words, you know, reasons why they want to be above the influence, and I hope that inspires people to realize that there's a lot more reasons to be above the influence than to be under them. The utilization of artwork to make change um, is, is just one way where our, our young people can use art as an outlet. Art isn't a positive outlet. And if you look at these drawings, you'll see they're freehand. Some of them are photography. Our young people are very creative, and it gets to show their artistic talent. Whether my students were a part of creating these pieces for Above the Influence campaign that was generated by the Youth Bureau here in Smithtown, or they were just observers in the community that saw the artwork, I was hoping that they could um, think further about this issue of staying above the influence or um, you know, rising above, knowing who you are, being proud. And in creating the artwork, there was pride involved, as well as displaying it and seeing what sort of emotions are elicited from the pieces themselves. I hope when people in the community come and see the exhibit here at the Smithtown Library that they not only enjoy the visual impact of it, but they also get the message and they also appreciate the young people who are trying to uh, communicate to them and to the community. We'd like to commend the Smithtown Youth Bureau, Smithtown School District, and Smithtown Library for supporting this community prevention effort. For more information on this and other prevention programs, please call the Suffolk County Prevention Resource Center at area code 631-608-5014. Up next, we have Anthony Rizzuto from the Seafield Center to discuss consumer access to treatment. We'll be right back. They'll be fine, I hope. What if you could prevent a young person from getting hurt or killed? What should I do? If you could turn back the clock and stop an underage drinking party from ever happening, now you can. Pick up the phone and call 1-866-UNDER-21. It's your community, your call, and it's completely anonymous.
Timely access to the appropriate level of treatment is of key importance when someone reaches the point where they're ready to seek help for a substance use problem. Recovery advocates have become increasingly concerned that insurance companies, rather than treatment professionals, have the final say in the type of care someone can receive. Legislation has been introduced in New York to address this concern. Joining us today to discuss this issue in greater depth is Anthony Rizzuto, Provider Relations Representative for Seafield Center. Hey, Anthony, right. thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. The whole issue of treatment and readiness for treatment is so important. What's gotten you involved in this whole subject? Well, you know, I've been working in the field now for about 15 years. And, uh, you know, one of the things that you know when you work in this field is that uh, people, what's inherent in the illness is that when people want to get help, um, usually it doesn't happen in the beginning. There's denial involved mm -hmm. and they don't want to get help. People that love them and care about them want them to get help, they don't want to get help. Right. But then it comes to a point where they finally say, okay, I'm ready. And then they come to a, either me or to a place that's a professional treatment facility and they will be evaluated and when they try to get them this, the level of care that they need, um, in many instances they're being denied by their insurance company. So it's not a lack of not having the benefit. Um, the, the, the specific people I'm talking about right now are people that have insurance, they have benefits, mm -hmm. um, but when you try to access that benefit, you know, we run into a lot of roadblocks. So there's a disconnect between the findings or assessment of the treatment professional and what the insurance company is willing to authorize. Correct. Uh, most times what would happen is we, w for instance, at Seafield, we do a 16-page biopsychosocial. So we got a pretty extensive history. Um, we've been with the client now for an hour and a half, two hours, getting a history on them, getting as much information as we can, mm -hmm. making a determination of what this person's struggling with, pick up the phone, call up the insurance company. So in, in a typical case, somebody who come to us will do this and we'll determine perhaps that they are suffering from opioid dependence um, and our recommendation would be uh, treatment, uh, would be a detox, you know, followed perhaps with an inpatient rehab if, the, if it warrants it. Mm -hmm. And then when we make the phone call to the insurance company, we're being told that um, no, they, they don't meet medical necessity and the argument that they will give is that a person can't die from withdrawal mm -hmm. of opiates. Um, now, if you've ever seen anybody withdraw from high-level uh, addiction, it's very, very uncomfortable. And, and the argument that I make is they might not die from the withdrawal, but what they're willing to do has the ability to kill them mm -hmm. or others um, in the process. And, you know, I think you, you see a lot of these, the pharmacy shootings, and you see a lot of things that have come out of people that were addicted. Um, so that's the frustration. The frustration is, is treatment professionals, mm -hmm. and I'm not the only one experiencing this. The reason mm -hmm. that we're doing what we're doing is because a lot of us are experiencing this on a daily basis where people are finally coming to that point where they're ready to get help, and when we try to, and there's help available, mm -hmm. and, and we can't put the two of those together because insurance companies in a lot of instances are denying access. So on the one hand you have for detox, which is the medical part of the process in terms of helping somebody stay safe while they withdraw from a drug. You have denials in that regard, but you also have denials for rehab. And I'm hearing from a lot of people that the rationale used is because the person has not, quote, failed in outpatient yeah. treatment. Talk That's a that. big one. That's a big one. That's really frustrating. We, we've actually heard that term said. We've heard them say that, have they been an outpatient before? And in some, in some cases, the answer is no. And they'll say, well, they need to attend outpatient and fail at outpatient. If they fail at outpatient, then call us back and we'll revisit this discussion. And to me, that's ludicrous. Um, when you have a person mm -hmm. who is finally gets to the point where they're ready to get the help, and in some cases, you know, we, we have people reporting using 10 bags a day, 15 bags a day. Of heroin. Um, of heroin, mm -hmm. yes, or, or taking 20 or 30 pills a day. And a person like that there is coming in to get help. Um, it's just, it doesn't make any sense um, to deny somebody like that and try to have them do something on a much smaller level. If you're using that much, you're probably getting high a big majority of the day. Mm -hmm. And to think that you're gonna be able to go on an outpatient setting, what I've experienced is mm -hmm. the adherence 
to outpatient doesn't exist. Right. They can't make a commitment to every day get up and go to the program. That's been what my experience mm -hmm. has been. So we're, we're opposed to that. We believe that you do an accurate assessment, you determine what the appropriate level of care is, and then you go to place them in that uh, level of care. And again, the argument being that most of these people on their policy, they have detox, um, seven days per calendar year, 30 days of rehab per calendar year, and 60 visits. So it's not that they don't have the benefit. Mm -hmm. Remember, they've been paying into this benefit sometimes 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And thinking that, God forbid I ever need it, I'm covered. Right. Now when they go to access it, they realize that this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And that's the frustrating thing. And families are up in arms when they come and, and the person finally agrees and we can't help them. So how did you get involved? And I understand um, you're a founder <coughs> of an organization known as FIST. Right. How does FIST fit into this and how did the legislation kind of get developed and move along? Right. So FIST is an acronym for Families in Support of Treatment and it stemmed from uh, numerous families losing a loved one um, to addiction. FIST came about to organize people. So it's kind of like if you think of the hand, individually the fingers are kind of weak. Mm -hmm. But when you bring them together, there's strength and unity. So the idea behind FIST was to achieve three goals. One is to be able to provide resources um, and get people in need with the resources. Mm -hmm. The second part was to be able to provide awareness and education for communities. And the third one was to gather community support for this bill that we're trying to have passed. How will the legislation change things? Well, the main thing is that it's going gonna, it's gonna to change uh, the decision-making process would be on the part of the professional who's doing the assessment. Look, this was done in the mid to late 80s in Pennsylvania. Um, that's kind of where we came up with this as we saw what happened over there where people were being denied access. It's PA Act 106. Um, so we're looking to recreate the same thing where folks that have benefits um, would be able to go see a doctor, a psychiatrist, a treatment professional, and would be able to have the determination by them mm -hmm. as opposed to the insurance company. And basically what it says is if the doctor or the psychiatrist says this is what I need, as long as I go to a place that's in network with you, mm -hmm. then it has to be covered. And clearly you have a lot of passion behind this. Mm -hmm. This is really important to you. Um, viewers probably have some interest in both FIST and maybe looking into the legislation a bit more. How might they find that out? They're welcome to call me. Um, my uh, phone number is area code 516-316-6387 or they're welcome to send me an email. It's arizzuto at seafieldcenter.com. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank today. you. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Up next, we revisit our segment on prescription abuse to addiction. Stay tuned. Who else has been taking your prescriptions? Keep your medicine and your family safe and secure. Mind your meds. To learn how, visit the partnership at drugfree.org. The issue of opiate use is a growing concern in our communities, schools, and homes. All concerned parties would like to know what can be done to best address and deter this issue from escalating any further. In our archive segment, we revisit the subject with a few clinical professionals to get clarity on this detrimental trend, as well as some suggestions for prevention. When prescription drug use began to go up in the early 1990s, reached current levels by the early part of the 21st century, and continues at those high levels today. So uh, where the, the correlation comes into play is individuals who begin their use of narcotics through prescription use, which is far more common than heroin use. Prescription drug overdoses are outstripping automobile accidents as a cause of death. So we have a huge problem out there. It's primarily led by the opioid prescription drugs, but we also have a lot of concern about some of the benzodiazepines and some concern about the stimulants as well. People are becoming addicted to prescription pain relievers. Then they don't have a doctor to prescribe them for them anymore. Or 
they run out of them. As people that become addicted to prescription drugs are unable to find them or afford them because the prescribing measures have changed, we're, we're putting in safeguards to prevent people from getting inappropriate prescriptions, the price goes up on the street, then people transition over to heroin. It's a lot cheaper to find heroin on Long Island than it is to buy these prescription drugs from uh, you know, somebody trying to sell them on the street. Well, the major problem is uh, twofold. Number one, um, we do not train physicians well in, uh, in the etiology of pain uh, and in the management of pain, the appropriate chronic management of pain. Uh, as a result, um, there is uh, an overprescribing of narcotic pain medications. Doctors often find themselves with the dilemma of addressing a patient who's in their office who has complaints that, that appear legitimate and genuine, uh, and they're trained to respond to people's reports and, and to do something to treat, you know, if they can't solve their problem for them, they help alleviate their suffering. So they're doing many things out of compassion. At the same time, we recognize that pain is a very real problem and it has to be addressed. So I think that that goes back to our training as physicians. Physicians have been well trained to respond to pain as a symptom and recognize that treating pain effectively helps people who have acute problems recover more quickly and people with chronic problems remain more functional uh, and have better life satisfaction. Uh, unfortunately, I think what has not gone along with that is doctors have not been trained to recognize substance misuse and addiction and uh, have no idea how to manage those types of situations. So there's an overemphasis with a good benefit for treating pain, there's an underemphasis on recognizing that along with the benefits of pain medication, there are significant costs involved. So as we put down the, the safeguards to prevent prescription opioids from being misprescribed or, or taken inappropriately, we really need to put down treatment as well. We need to have more treatment available. Now, folks in the treatment community have known about this problem for a long time. In fact, it was good evidence that, that beginning in the early 1990s and reaching current levels by around 2002, prescription narcotic use had gone up enormously in this country. In addition to that, the disease of addiction has both a genetic and an environmental component. And when the environment is, uh, is, is uh, um, inviting, uh, such as what happens with the medicine chest, uh, you expect to see an increase, and that's what we're seeing. The federal government does surveys, national household surveys of drug use, and what they found is that the majority of people reporting misuse of prescription medications actually obtain those medications from their own medicine cabinet or the medicine cabinet of a friend of the, or fa of the family member. So an important step to reducing the availability of these drugs would be for people to appropriately dispose of unused prescriptions as quickly as possible. The Suffolk County Police Department has recently begun a program where they will collect unused prescriptions, no questions asked, at the local precinct station. I don't think there are very many Americans who throw away the extra pill that they may have left over from, from a prescription, even if it's an antibiotic. I mean, we just, as a, as a class of people, just don't want to waste anything. You know? so, so if you open up anybody's medicine chest, my own included, you'll find that there are prescriptions that uh, are no longer necessary for you to have there. And in fact, we do have a program out here in Long Island of uh, givebacks where the police stations will actually uh, take the medications, no questions asked, and throw them into a bin and then, you know, through the proper channels they get destroyed. Nationally, we have been seeing a continued increase of people being admitted to treatment for, for opiate misuse. Um, there has been about a 345% increase, I believe, over the last decade or so. We're seeing it among youth here in Long Island and nationally. Federal studies indicate roughly um, 14 out of every 100 graduating high school seniors has tried uh, a prescription narcotic before they graduate high school. So that makes it fairly common. Much lower levels have tried heroin. Uh, but somebody who begins to use prescription drugs and it becomes a problem for them may find themselves turning to heroin as a readily available and initially uh, less expensive because it's a more potent drug uh, solution to their problem than continuing to find prescription narcotics. But eventually use of heroin has its own 
unique set of circumstances that make it more difficult. Now, heroin is very hard to control because you have no idea what you're getting on the street. You have no idea what it might be cut with. The, the, the levels may vary a lot, and it gets into a whole nother level of contact with other sorts of people on the street. So heroin becomes a bigger problem. Not only that, heroin isn't government regulated. You don't know exactly what the dosage you're going to administer to yourself is, so it becomes a big problem with uh, overdosing. Parents are the uh, anti-drug. I, I agree with that uh, commercial uh, 100%. Uh, there's no question that the forebrain, a part of the brain in uh, youngsters, is not well developed, and it's one of the areas where uh, exposure to drugs will, will actually change the structure of the forebrain and make them more prone to addiction. The greatest tool for, for, for prevention purposes is, is to, and it's a cliche almost, is to have an open and honest relationship with your, with your children. Overall, I think that teenagers, young teenagers, older ones, need really straight information about what's going on. Parents who are on guard about that discuss it with their children legitimately and logically, not, not from a fear standpoint, but I think that that uh, kind of open dialogue is what we need more of in order to, to prevent some of the uh, addiction we see. So I think telling the truth is really the most important part of it. For information about Operation Medicine Cabinet, contact the Suffolk County Police Community Outreach Bureau at area code 631-852-6109. We'd like to thank our viewers for tuning into Something of Substance. Our video magazine is a public resource and we're eager to hear your feedback as well as any suggestions you may have for future show topics. For all inquiries and concerns, please contact me at art.flesher at suffolkcountyny.gov. I'm your host, Art Flesher, and join us again next month for more of Something of Substance. has been taking your prescriptions. Keep your medicine and your family safe and secure. Mind your meds. To learn how, visit the partnership at drugfree.org.